Hey, it's Pastor. I am so excited you could join us uh, as we hear and listen to the Word of God. And I'm always hoping and praying that He's going to specifically guide your life and give you the hope and the peace that you cannot give to yourself. He is the power every time He promises to work through this Word. If He has worked in your life, we want to hear about it. Please email us, let us in, encourage us uh, by emailing office.amazinglove at gmail.com. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, make messages like this ongoing, uh, go to our giving tab online or download the app. Go to the app store and search Amazing Love Luther. But now, may you continue to grasp how wide, high, and deep and long is the love of Christ in this for you. Thank you. Christmas. Good to see everyone. Can I say that in church? Is that all right? <laughs> Christmas. And I don't know about you, but uh, it's time to start decorating, right? Uh, maybe some of you use the warm weather, uh, put up the Christmas lights. Uh, maybe some of you have done the Christmas trees. Uh, I'm just real curious about Christmas trees. How many do the fake trees? How many do real trees? I and my vacuum like fake trees, so I, I think uh, others... <laughs> have thought the same, right? Yeah. And um, I love that we're always trying to do it bigger and better. Have you been to Lowe's lately? When, when I grew up, the decorations, I mean, everyone had the big colored bulbs, and it's like that was all there was. You, you could only buy the inefficient big colored bulbs, um, and, and that, that's it. I went into Lowe's the other day. Have you seen the selection? Oh my goodness, there's icicles, there's like the artistic bulbs that look like, like they're a vase or something. I mean, they're, they're, they're just so artistic. Uh, and then there's the you know, LED selection, and now we have those spotlight things. I saw one at Lowe's, and it has like this firework display, and, and just like crazy, right? You know, so you have fireworks going off, you know. So I just think we're at a time of year where we're always trying to make it bigger and better. You know what I'm saying? You're going to the mall and you're looking for the perfect gift. You're making the meal and you're hoping it turns out just right. You're hoping that the neighbors drive by and inwardly you wouldn't say this to the neighbors, but you're hoping they say your house is the best, right? <laughs> yeah, that's why we do it. And it's like the, the inner Martha Stewart of us all comes out and we're just, we're hoping for this, <laughs> right? You know, but... But can we be real? I know I'm a realist. I'm not a pessimist. At least I tell other people. Can I just be real? And can I encourage you to be real? If you're comfortable, could you just turn to the person next to you and tell them, it's not going to be perfect. It's, it's not going to be perfect. It's just, you know, and, and I just think, you know, you're welcome for that therapy because I already feel better. You know, I mean, the pressure's off, you know, because... Because the truth is, you're going to want a white Christmas and it's raining. The truth is, you're going to want to be home and you're stuck somewhere else. The truth is, that gal uh, hoping for a hippopotamus and like sang a song about it, she's getting tube socks from grandma whether she likes it or not. And, 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 and so, I mean, it's just, it's not going to be perfect this Christmas. But can I tell you about one time? You see, there was this one time. When it seemed like it all happened according to plan. There, there was this one time when everything was merry and right. There, there was this, this one time where literally the stars aligned, where the lights in heaven were better than any National Christmas Lampoon's house. I mean, it was, it was amazing this one Christmas. That's what we're going to talk about. Are you ready? We're, we're going to go back and we're going to take a look at that one Christmas. And I just think if we... Keep remembering what happened that one Christmas. If we have a laser focus on that one, maybe if our houses don't look like this, it's going to be all right. Maybe if they take back what you strive to give them, it's going to be all right. Maybe we just need to center ourselves, recenter ourselves to see what that one Christmas means. 
Because here it is. A Savior's born. And you need him. And I need him. Because I have not been yet made perfect. But he was the perfect one. He was the perfect gift this imperfect world was waiting for. He is our soul's satisfaction. He is the light of life and the light of the world. He is the reason that we gather to celebrate. And so welcome again to Christmas in church. We do it like no other place. Sorry, Macy's, because we have Jesus. And for me, I'm always drawn back to to the story of Christmas because of a disciple named Linus. Linus was from the Charlie Brown clan of the disciples. And and Linus, he, he always tells the story right. When it comes to what Christmas is all about, the disciple Linus said, For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. But but that really originate from Linus? Do you know? Did it come from Linus? No, it came from Luke, a greater disciple. And, and, and I don't know about you, I grew up with some Chris, Christmas Eve services and, and reciting Luke 2. Has anyone ever had to recite Luke 2? Just a, a quick, yeah, a few people, right? And, and, and whenever I get to Christmas Eve and you have Luke 2, I always feel like there's so much there. Like, I want to talk about so much and I, I only have like one sermon, right? You know, and so what I'm going to do in the next coming weeks is I'm going to extrapolate the truths of Luke 2. We're going to dig in like never before. And, and if you want to, if my academics out there, if you want to know what we call this in church world, a quick overview is isagogics. What we're going to do is called exegesis. Can you say we're learning exegesis? Just say exegesis. See, you're smarter already. It's good to be in church for Jesus and you're smarter. So anyway, uh, we're doing exegesis. It just means we're focusing on every little detail of the Luke 2 account and we're extrapolating what that means for us. You ready to get into it? All right, let's turn to there. Uh, Luke chapter 2, you can follow on the screen, um, in your worship folder, whatever works best for you. It says, in those days, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Can I just pause there? You know, many people have biblical names. No one has taken up the biblical name Quirinius. You know, no one's been brave enough, so I just challenged someone out there, you know, and I'm not sure, it, it sounds weird, Quirinius. Anyway, anyway but um, Quirinius was governor of Syria. Uh, sorry for that jaunt. <clears throat> Everyone went to their own town to register, so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. These are some awesome words. And what it talks about, whether it be through Bethlehem, whether it be a virgin who was with child, it talks about the fact that he came at just the right time. We're going to talk a little bit about God's timing together in these moments. May God so bless the discussion. When it comes to timing, I don't know if you're like me. At Christmas, it's easy to wish to be at some time else with someone else and somewhere else. Do you know what I'm saying? There's a spirit of nostalgia that, that you're always looking back maybe to a time that was that can never be again. And for me, I, it happened because I was watching the, 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 the Christmas classic uh, Home Alone. And they were doing the children's practice. And it reminded me of one of my favorite memories when I was in the Christmas Eve service. And I'll never forget for me, you know, singing uh, Still, Still, Still in the junior choir. And then the senior choir was singing something on top of it. So you had like competing melodies, but they were both beautiful. And the place was packed. And, and, and it was like, this is what the halls of heaven must be like. And, and there's a part of me that wants to go back. That there's a part of me that wants to go back to the childhood home I grew up in to see our siblings. Who now have kids and we've never been together for Christmas since, right? You know? Wants to go back. Was the music really that good? Was I pitchy that day or am, am I remembering it right, you know? I want to even know, like, what was the presence? What was, you know, what was that? There's something in me that just, I always want to be somewhere else, it seems, at Christmas. Can you relate to this emotion? Maybe, maybe this Christmas, one of the things you're dealing with is there is someone or there is somewhere that, that you miss and you want to be and and. and the reality is it's not possible. 
It's not the time. Can you hold on to that tension for me? Because as we get into the word of God, we see what God does with timing. And, and, and they're simple words, but they're, they're beautiful words. Uh, can you say these words with me? It says, in those days. Yeah, and, and what are those days? Um, it, it reminds me of what Galatians 4 says. Uh, Galatians 4, it, it put it this way, when the set time had fully come. So there was this, this exact time. The, the, this time, uh, maybe 1 AD, you know, uh, historians look. But, but there is an exact time. And, and I need to tell you a little bit of history. See, the time that Jesus came into this world was known as the Pax Romana or the Roman peace. And because of the Pax Romana, it meant that there was safety. That you could travel abroad. It kind of reminds me of the interstate system for America. So there was infrastructure so you could travel abroad. And there was a common language to use. In all of the Roman Empire, a common language so you could, you know, uh, trade or or do certain things. Um, And I look at the Pax Romana. And I look at the message that needs to be shared of this gospel of grace, of a risen Savior. And there's safety and there's roads and there's a common language. And God chose the right time. He came at just the right time so everyone could know what we sang about, that we have a Savior. And if you just think it's my thoughts, uh, there's someone smarter than me named Origen who also had the same thoughts. Uh, Look look at what Origen said. All you historians are geeking out right now. Origen uh, from the... First centuries A.D., uh, it said, For righteousness has arisen in his days, and there was an abundance of peace, the Pax Romana, which took its commencement at his birth, God preparing the nations for his teaching, that they might be under one prince, the king of the Romans, Augustus, and that it might not, owing to the want of union among the nations, caused by the existence of many kingdoms, be more difficult for the apostles to Jesus to accomplish the task, enjoined upon them by their master when he said, Go and teach all nations. Now, that is the longest run-on sentence ever, but do you get the point? Origen, I have seen that God was working with the timing. And so here's our first takeaway. This Christmas, I, I would just love to tell you, you're not where you are right now by accident, but by God's intent. And, and maybe the, the biggest news is this, that That maybe this was the Christmas that you needed to be in this area to come to Amazing Love, to hear a message, to know that maybe this child was born for you so that you could understand you were born for him. Maybe it's this Christmas that you understand once again he gave you the light of life so that you could find the light of the world, which is him. Maybe it's this Christmas that he's ordaining your days in order to meet him like never before so you see he is the only great thing, the only great gift worthy of holding on to with a tight clenched fist. This one Christmas, he still has plans and purposes for your salvation. He ordained your days so you could meet him, so you could know him. And that's why we gather. But on a practical standpoint, because we like to talk about practical things, what it means is that you can be fully present this Christmas. Instead of wishing for people who can't be with you, you can be thankful for the people who are there. Instead of wishing for the time or the place that you cannot be, you can be thankful for what you see around you. You can thank God not for the things you no longer have, those, those childhood memories and those childhood things, or, or maybe a time that was better, but you can open your eyes and see that he has given you right now evidence of grace, right now good things in your life. Be fully present this Christmas. It's not accidental. I loved uh, also this passage. Look at this. It says, From one man he made all the nations on earth that they inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. That's you and I. I am in Frankfurt for a purpose. I know that full well. As long as I'm here, I want to be present. I want to be active. I want to be following my Lord. I want to be proclaiming my Lord, not wishing to be anywhere else, but with you sharing Jesus. What about you? All right. But there's more here. And for, for me, I wonder, what does he do when, when we wait? Can we talk about that a little bit? What, what, what does he do when we wait? And um, I was talking a little bit about growing trees. Has anyone ever grown a tree before? Grown a tree, anyone? 
Not, not, not many. Okay, it's, it's good. It's kind of hard. I was talking to my dad, and he's got like orange trees and mango trees because he lives in Florida. But I'm content. I'm in the place I need to be. Anyway, um, uh, anyway uh, but, but he had these 30 oranges, right? And, uh, and 30 oranges that he didn't get because a storm came, you know, and he thought finally this was the year where he was going to have this ripe crop, but the storm came. They're all unedible on the floor, right? And he has a mango tree, and the mango tree still isn't producing anything. Well, me, I tried a cherry tree. And my cherry tree right now looks worse than Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. I mean, it is not a good thing. It will be a while, okay? And um, I was talking to someone else who said, you know, even when the cherries grow, the birds are going to get them. I'm like, thanks, guy. I was looking forward to cherry pie. But anyway, no, the birds are going to get them. Thanks. And I I just think of, like, how hard it is to produce good fruit from a tree. I have an appreciation for farmers, friends. You know, that's just a hard deal. And and if you've ever grown a tree, uh, maybe you've heard... um, when the best time to plant a tree is. Have you heard this one? It's a Chinese proverb, actually. It says the the best time to plant it was 20 years ago. (laughs) And why? Because it takes time. (laughs) That's right. Because in 20 years, my dad might have oranges. And in about 100, I might have a cherry pie. You know, it's just, it, it takes time. Trees take time to develop good fruit. Here's where I'm going. Do you know you're a tree? Welcome. Yeah. God planted you on the day of your conversion, and and he actually legitimately wants you to bear good fruit, not spoiled fruit, not inedible fruit, not the fruit that is not ripe yet or or too raw. He wants good fruit. Let me remind you. He, He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you, planted you, so you might bear fruit. But is it possible fruit takes time? Is it possible it takes a time to to have an abundance of fruit, to be the kind of of soil and and plant that that produces that hundredfold? Is it possible that that this all takes time? Well, Well, let me convince you. I remember all the people who had to wait. Do you remember King David? All right, he, he beats Goliath, he's anointed by Samuel, and did he become king right away? Not at all. Sorry, young man. What about Joseph? You remember when he got his dreams? He's like a little boy, like, hey, you hear this dream? You know, you're all bowing down to me, it's pretty awesome. How long did it take him? Years, right? He's probably an adult male before that comes true. Jesus. First of all, we know he's this branch that was growing from Jesse's tree, right? He, he had to, to take time to get here, take time that was intentional to get here, to, to sprout from that tree. But, but, but then even when the time came for him to come, and, and he was born with some incredible attributes, look at the attributes he was born with. He said the Spirit of God was on him, wisdom and understanding, the counsel and might, the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the delight and the fear of the Lord, all these things, right? You'd be like, it seems like he's ready, Right? Born with all this. When did he start his ministry? The perfect God? The one who had this spirit? When when did he start? 30 years later. You know, friends, we we live in a culture that overemphasizes arrival and downplays the process. Can I say that again? We live in a culture that overemphasizes arrival and it downplays the process. And, and, and what I, I believe is this, don't, don't downplay the process of who God is making you right now. Don't, don't downplay the steps it takes to get there. And, and to further back up my point of, of how sometimes we overemphasize uh, the arrival, I saw this prodigy pianist. The, the prodigy pianist was on GMA and um, he played at Car- Carnegie Hall. And what does it take to get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 Right? And uh, let, let me just show you um, a little bit here. Very, very special story. You're going to meet a mar- remarkable young man. He's a cancer survivor who started taking piano lessons to help him recover after chemotherapy. Now that scene turned out to unlock talent and passion that got him all the way to Carnegie Hall this weekend. Daniel Collin are here to play for us right now. at the end there where he's like looking around while playing, you know. 
Ain't no thing, you know. Keith. We love the prodigy, we hate the process, don't we? Can we, can we be real with that? We love the prodigy, we hate the process. We, we love the arrival, we don't like what it takes to get there. And, and, and yet what we know is that it takes practice and it takes the process to arrive anywhere good. This is what this means. In our spiritual lives, you know the devil's at work trying to downplay your process. For some of you, it was a big deal that you're in church today. But, but what he's going to try to convince you, it wasn't a big deal. People do it all the time. Not in your life. Not in the way you needed to be here. Don't let him minimize. Don't let him downplay the process of what you're doing right now. For some of you, I talk about reading the Bible. And, and I know it's hard. And, and so this is what happens. You read five minutes. You're a little confused. You think you got something, but not a lot. And, and then because you downplay the process. You say, I shouldn't try that again. Right? You downplay the process. You're like, I can't let five become ten. And the devil's at work because he knows if five becomes ten, becomes 20 minutes, you might start to see the richness of the revelation of God. And he doesn't want you to arrive. He doesn't want that abundant fruit. And so he's going to downplay every process along the way. It was a big deal for kids to be here today. Every mom and dad who brought a kid today knows that. But what the devil is doing, he's downplaying the process. He's like, it happens all the time. Not a big deal. Right? It's a huge deal. You know what this speaks into the life of your family in order to hear the Savior? What it speaks into their own hearts is they're here understanding the importance of Jesus to find Christ in Christmas. Don't downplay the process, but understand what he is doing. Don't let him minimize those big steps. We're about to bear abundant fruit, but it takes a process to get there. But you know our real struggle? Our real struggle when it comes to the timing of God is... I don't even think is waiting as much is really the authority of God. Can I talk a little bit about that? I was talking to my coach. I'm in a pastor's network. And this coach says, you know, uh, most people don't understand the sovereignty of God or don't consider it. And, and what do I mean by sovereignty? I mean that God, before you knew him, already stood as king of kings. That God, before you knew him, already stood as Lord of lords. That, that he is worthy of all praise, that he has all power, that he's worthy of all glory, and he stands so far above. This is the sovereign God. Do you know what we emphasize in Christian America? It's good, it's true, but maybe we overemphasize it's called the imminence of God which is this idea that he doesn't stand above, he stands beside. And, and this is true, that, that, that Jesus is my buddy. He's my homeboy, my home slice, right, you know? And so I say, my buddy, my buddy, my buddy is Jesus, you know? It's, it's, that's, that's what we're doing, right? And that's where most cultural people, you can't speak guilt to me, my buddy's Jesus, we're all good to go. But both are true. And in this culture, I think what we need is more of an understanding of the sovereignty of God. More of an understanding that he's not looking for your cue on what to do. Let's talk about that a little bit. You ever coach the coach? I watch enough sports and football where sometimes I don't agree, okay? And John Fox is a conservative play caller. Did anyone see that? And John Fox likes to run the ball. He doesn't like to throw it deep. And sometimes after four runs that came before and it's third and 12, I don't want to see a running back draw. No, you're not fooling anyone with a running back draw. I want to see four people jetting out and throwing it deep. I don't want any conservative because I played football and sometimes I like to coach the coach. I know better, right? It's a real humble position, isn't it? My four years of high school football have made me an expert. <laughs> but we laugh because we relate, don't we? I mean, we go into doctors, doc, I got to tell you what's going on. I know you just read this thing, but I got to, I read WebMD, and it's telling, you know, hmm, oh, I didn't go to eight years of school, that's all right, tell me how it is. Do we do this with God? Do we coach the coach? I need to remind you, friends, this is true, our God, he's in heaven, he does whatever pleases him. Do you know when Jesus was born, he didn't call me up first and ask me, what do you think, Pax Romana? He didn't do that. Do you know he's still working and he's not asking. He's just telling you how it is. And so, dear friends, what I see in myself and what maybe I would encourage you to see is that we are filled with pride. 
And pride is the worst way to be to stand before a holy God because what pride says is I will tell you what to do and you will not tell me. Pride says I do not accept your timetable. You will operate by mine. And of this we need to repent. Of this we need to say I don't want to be it. I don't want to do it. It ain't helpful. You and I need a sovereign Lord. Because if the reality is true, if he operated according to our will, our ways of normalcy, we would have never been saved. But it was a sovereign love that went above our notions of love. It was a sovereign love that said, I'm going to come for sinners and enemies. It was a sovereign love that said, I'll take the king of kings and make him the lowest servant and die on a cross so that those who didn't deserve it, so those who are prideful, so those who didn't even want me could know they have hope in me. This is his sovereign love and a sovereign way that is so far beyond our ways. Friends, it's good he's sovereign. So here's what we understand and He's sovereign in his timing, and he's sovereign in his love. Jesus would not be born if it were up to our ways of doing things. Why would he come into the mess? Why would he die for enemies? No, he's sovereign over that. He's got a better way and a better love that one Christmas. One final thought. You still with me? All right. One final thought then. When it comes to waiting, has anyone ever had to wait for you? Ever had to wait for you? I want to ask about who's getting ready for supper and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll pick on myself. So, um, uh, so I remember my senior year of high school, and you go on a senior trip. So for all the things you put up with during the year, you know, it culminates in this special prize called Great America. Right, and so we would go to the glorious spot called Gurney, Illinois, and uh, and it was the day where you know the raging bull was big. It was the first time the raging bull was released. And I was looking forward to that and the giant drop and all these different things, and and uh, and so I was excited for it. The only problem was I didn't wake up for it. Didn't wake up for it. And everyone else had left the house, and I, I get a call from the teacher um, who's saying, you know, Dustin, the whole bus is waiting for you. Which at that point, I'm kind of like, go on, be head. I don't want to, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay, I get it, I'm wrong, you know? But I get up and I, I hurry over, I get there in 10 minutes or whatever, and I walk on the bus. You ever get the glare? I mean, this, and you know it's coming, right? You know it's coming, but it's just like, stop it, I know I was wrong, right? You know, but, but I'm so glad, you know, that they waited because, you know, now I could go on the raging bull. And, and that was the time that my body could handle it. And it was great, right? Why they waited for me is great. Sometimes we're, we look through such a personal lens. Everything has to be according to my will, my time, my time frame. But what if, friends, what if Christmas happened not 2,000 but 6,000 years ago? What if it was 6,000 years ago and he had already returned about 4,000 years ago? The answer is we wouldn't be on the bus that goes to that greater land. And so why is God waiting? And what's he waiting for? Here's the promise. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone. I love a God who wants everyone. Like my worst enemy, like those in the Middle East, like those in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, everyone. I think he pretty much says everyone. I don't know how you read it. But I love a God who's saying, I'm going to wait for everyone because I want everyone to get on the bus. Maybe we need to think of that. Maybe we need to remember that when it comes to God's timetable, he's ordering it according to his grace. And how good this is. How, how good it is that he waited for us to be in 2017, this one Christmas, so you and I could remember again, there is a Christ of Christmas who is the greatest gift this world has to offer. And maybe he's waiting so that the grandchild you haven't met yet because you're a teenager can be beyond that bus as well. Maybe he was waiting so there was a Amelia Pratt and a Jonathan Bowen who could be on the bus through the waters of baptism because they could be born. Sometimes we say, come Lord Jesus. I'm like, wait Lord Jesus, if you want more on the bus, like I get it. Because the temptation is to sit on the bus and be like those guys who gave me the glare. The temptation is to sit on the bus and like, well I'm ready, let's go. 
but he waits. He's got grace according to his timetable. May we see his sovereignty in what he does. May we see again he came at just the right time and he's still working according to his timetable to draw so many more to see the Savior this one Christmas. Can I pray for us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is hard to be humble. It is hard to be humble. And so I pray a radical prayer. Give me the spirit of humility. Teach me those lessons. Oh, I don't want to pray it, but I just prayed it. Oh, humility. Help me to humble myself in order to see your sovereign love. Help me to trust that you are still with me and for me even when I don't understand. And I'm okay to wait today if you're going to put more people on the bus. Maybe use me to put more people on the bus that is going to that greater land that sees Jesus as Savior. Amen. Amen. Please stand.